are going on. We lift up Sonia today, and we ask you, Lord God, to intervene, to touch her, Lord, and not only to just uh, give her strength and recovery from COVID, but that her singing voice would be able to still be used to bring glory to your name, God, when this is over with. Touch and work on her behalf and bring a miracle uh, for her today, God. Guide the doctors. Help the medicine do the job it needs to do. But, Lord, you be the healer. You be the healer. Every other name and request on our list we bring to you tonight, and we just ask you, Lord God, that you would touch and move and have your way. Lord, be glorified. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15 tonight. I want to encourage you this evening from the Word, remind you of some things. This is one of those stories that, that's a little challenging, but I believe there's some things. If we don't get hung up on the not being able to understand the, the cultural difference from the culture of, of first century Palestine to today, we don't get caught up in in the cultural difference, there's some lessons that we can glean from this story that will be a blessing to us uh, tonight. Matthew uh, chapter number 15, verse number 21. Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came to him out of those same coasts and cried to him, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now, first of all, Jesus is a Jew, and here comes a Gentile woman to him. All right, so she is not of the, she's not of the, the Jewish uh, descent. She is a, an outsider. She's a, a Gentile, and she comes to Jesus asking for help. Look at verse 23. He answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away for she crieth after us. Jesus doesn't answer until the point where the disciples say, well, Lord, if you're not going to answer, then tell her to go away because she's bothering us. <laughs> he answered them and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Picture this in your mind. Here's this woman. She's not an Israeli. She's not Jewish. She's a Gentile. She comes to Jesus. Lord, I need your help. My daughter is, is devil-possessed, tormented, grieved by a demon. Need your help. And Jesus just ignores her. Obviously, she didn't just ask once. She keeps on. Jesus isn't answering her. The disciples say, well, Lord, if you're not going to answer her, send her away. You know, she's just causing such a fuss and such a mess. Jesus still as I, as I understand this, Jesus still isn't speaking to her, but he's speaking to his disciples, and he says, guys, you know, I'm not sent but to the house of Israel. So he's, he's still not addressing her, and he's telling her by speaking to somebody else, she's not, she's not in the deal here. She, she's not one of us. I'm not even sent to her people. This just seems so strange, right? It's so hard for us to, to wrap our, our head around. It can be. Then she, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. She said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said, Woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made well from that very hour. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to the truth of your Scripture tonight. Let me just say things that are truthful, but things that are encouraging. Feed us, Lord, I pray, your sweet 
heavenly spiritual manna tonight that we may all grow in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Life has a lot of disappointments. <laughs> I, I mean, if y'all hadn't figured that out by now, I'm sorry to bust your bubble, but life has a lot of disappointments, you know. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can seem that the disappointments outweigh the, uh, the joys, and there are seasons when they do. And it seems like every news that we get is bad news, and we can get weighed down by disappointments. However, we should never lower our expectations of God just because things aren't working out the way we want them to. God is still God. Even when my money is, is short, even when my health isn't, uh, isn't responding, even when, you know, People are, are rejecting me and, and turning away. Even when I've been witnessing and not had one soul respond uh, to the message, God is still God. God and, and so just because we're disappointed, you know, I'm sure you've all been there. We've asked God for jobs, and the job didn't go our way. We've asked God to give us favor in an interview, and the interview went bad. We, we've all been there. We've asked God to help us get this loan that we thought that we needed, and we were denied the finances. We, we all have those times of, of disappointment. We came, we felt sure that if we just went to the altar, God was going to heal us, and we walked away not at that moment healed like we thought we were going to. We've all had things that in our flesh are disappointments. And the human side of us wants to lower our expectations when something happens that's disappointing so that we don't get... Uh, shattered, right? Well, don't get your hopes up. Y'all have heard that saying, maybe said that. Well, don't get your hopes up because when our hopes are high and then the disappointment comes in, it seems to hurt worse. Uh, <laughs> being uh, born and raised a uh, Arkansas Razorback fan, uh, I have learned the hard way to not get my hopes up <laughs> because few and far between have been the successes on a big scale of the Arkansas Razorbacks. They can have a great year back when I was a kid, win the Southwest Conference and go to a bowl game and get just embarrassed, you know. And so you try not to get your, your hopes up too high. They can be the prohibitive favorites coming into a game and, and, and get made to look terrible. And so you try to not get your hopes up because, man, when you just knew they were going to win that trophy, and they didn't. A few years ago, uh, my favorite sport to watch is, uh, is college, uh, well, just baseball in general, but I really love college baseball. A few years ago, Arkansas made it to the national championship game. It's a series, and uh, they're playing a team that has been perennially very, very good, but Arkansas matched up extremely well. They had won the first game, only needed to win two. They get into the second game. They're ahead. It's getting late in the game. There's a little pop-up, foul ball. Three Arkansas players managed to let the ball drop between them and not catch it. A home run gets hit. The game gets lost, and the team doesn't even show up for the, for the third game that was, that was decisive. It just wasn't even a ball game. You're one, if they catch that ball, they're national champions in baseball. Don't catch it. They're the second place team. Caleb and I, I passed around a meme back when, uh, uh, when, when COVID started. It's like, COVID's not going to kill me. My, I died this day when the ball fell on the ground right between three gloves. So uh, when you get your hopes up on something, and sports for me is one of those things. I've been a Dallas Cowboy fan since 1978. I can first remember the Cowboys and Roger Staubach playing in 78 when I was about six years old. There have been three or four good years in the last 30 for the Dallas Cowboys. And so you look at the schedule and you say, yeah, they're going to lose those games. And that way when they win one, you're excited, but you don't get, all right. So I'm trying to be a little funny, but that goes to all parts of our life, doesn't it? We try not to get our hopes up very high because we don't want that crash of the disappointing news. That may be a defense mechanism that may help us in life, but let me tell you, don't apply that to God. Don't let your expectations be lowered of things spiritual. Have 
Uh, the old song is high hopes, pie in the sky hopes, have high hopes and high expectations. Base them off God's word and off his character. There will be times when it seems like he's not answering. There will be times when it seems like other people are getting your blessing. But you just hold on and you keep believing that God has not forgotten about you or canceled your blessing or ruled you out or is trying to punish you in some way by not answering your prayers. God does, oh, there's a scripture from Mark or Luke, uh, one of those, where the people are amazed at Jesus and they say he does all things well. He does. It's just sometimes we don't understand the way he's going about doing what we're asking him to do. So first of all, how do you keep your hopes high? First of all, you need to ask for help when you need help. Verse 25 this woman went ahead and came to Jesus anyway. You have to understand she would have known the cultural norms of her day. A woman doesn't go to a man and ask for help. Secondly, a Gentile woman doesn't go to a Jewish man and ask for help. Thirdly, a Gentile woman's not going to go to a rabbi of the Jewish faith who most people consider Jesus a, 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 a Jewish rabbi or teacher. So she's violating, as far as I can tell, just from my base knowledge, at least three big cultural norms by going to Jesus and asking for help. But she was in a point where she had to have some help. Folks, when we need help, we need to ask for help. And our source, our source number one, is the Lord. We need to be asking God to help. Don't wait until you've tried everything you know to do and nothing has worked out, and then in desperation you come and say, Oh, Lord. But the moment you wake up in the morning, began asking God for strength and for wisdom and for anointing and all the things you're going to need for that day because God knows what's coming. God knows what your day so ask for help. We're needy people, and we need to ask for help. God didn't intend for us to be John Wayne, right, or, you know, Clint Eastwood or Tom Selleck or whoever you want to think of as this strong, I'll do it myself kind of. No. Uh, when I was a kid, you'd see advertisements for the Mar Marlboro Man, right? You know, this just rugged, I'll do everything myself and, and, and that Americanism. But God created us to be interdependent. We are to be dependent on him, and as we trust in him, lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will lift you up. It should be our first call, not our last call, to go to the Lord for help. And then I want to challenge you. I know it's hard, but when you need help, yes, ask God, but ask your church family. Ask for help. You need somebody to pray with you, to believe with you, to, to, to just, sometimes you just need somebody to say, you know, I'm going through a season. Would you just listen? Can, can I just pour my heart out to you for just a minute? I know you don't have the answers. I just need somebody to talk to. And so reach out and ask. Right now, America is going through a time when uh, mental health is probably at the lowest maybe it's ever been. With all this isolation and COVID and wearing masks and don't touch and don't get too close to people and, and all of these things, people need people. We're created to be in family and in relationships, and we need people. So family, if you're struggling, yes, ask the Lord. Well, you know, it, it's ask. I'm supposed to be more mature than that. I'm supposed to be more grown up than that. I should be able to handle the little things on my own. Ask God for help. And then it's also okay, it needs to be okay with all of us for somebody to come to us and just say, hey, can we have a cup of coffee? Can we have a phone conversation? Can we just sit down? I know you don't have the answers. I just need to talk to somebody. And to be able to listen to them and not repeat it and not think less of them because they're telling you that they're struggling and not get on the gossip. But we ought to all be mature enough that somebody can reach out to us and say, I need somebody. Let me challenge you if you're watching this online. Contact information for our church is easy to find. Send me an email. Uh, get in touch with us. We would be happy to pray with you. And just to listen. Sometimes all we can do is listen and then say, we'll pray for you. But sometimes we need Jesus with flesh on, right? We all know the Lord is with us, but sometimes we need Jesus with flesh on to sit there and listen to us over a cup of coffee or a, a Diet Coke or, or something uh, to just pour out our hearts to one another. So the first step is pretty simple, but sometimes it's so hard to do. 
I need help. I need help. And to be willing to step out and to say, I need somebody to help. I, I can think of, there's a lady that I have a great friendship and relationship with that has stretched on for 15 or 16 years now. She came to my church. She had just shown up in our community. She had moved from Oklahoma. She had just shown up in our community. She began coming to church with a friend of hers. One day she finally said, Pastor, I've got to talk to you. Can we talk? I said, sure. We began to have a conversation, and she said, I'm in Arkansas because I'm running from the law. Uh, I've got bad checks and things in Oklahoma to the point where there's warrants out for my arrest. And uh, uh, right now they don't know where I'm at. Right now I'm, I'm ahead of the law, but I can't rest and I can't sleep. And now that I've come and I've gotten saved, I feel like it's the Christian thing to do for me to try to make this right. But the problem is if I go back, they're going to put me in jail. What do I do? I said, well, we're going to pray about it. I said, you need to make the decision that you need to make, but I, I'll tell you, I agree with you. If the Lord's putting it on your heart that you need to make this right, then you need to make it right. And so we'll pray that God will give you favor. So that went on for a couple of weeks where she would just say, oh, keep praying, keep praying. Finally, she went back to wherever it was in Oklahoma. You know what they did? They put her in jail. They gave her a court date. She had like, I don't know, 30 days or so between. She sat in jail for those two, three, four weeks until her court date. We're corresponding back and forth. You know, she'd send a letter. I'd send her one back. We're praying for favor. She goes before the judge. The judge says, can you, uh, can you repay? No, sir, I cannot. He issued her a jail sentence. She writes me, well, I've got however many months it is, but it was just jail, not prison. But she is devastated thinking, well, you know, I asked for God's help, and he, I'm still in trouble. I said, look, first of all, he could have given you more time than what he did. Secondly, he could have sent you to the Oklahoma Department of Corrections, which he didn't. And as bad as, as a county jail may be, it's better than being sent to the Department of Corrections. So we began during that time. I would send her Bible studies that were fill in the blank. I'd work out. I'd work out six or seven pages. We'd go, we started at Genesis and just kind of the highlights. And so I would work out these Bible studies, fill in the blanks with Scripture references, send them to her. She would complete them, send them back to me. And then I would send her some more. She would complete them and send them back to me. So we did Bible correspondence while she was in, uh, in, in uh, so what am I trying to tell you? Sometimes, you know, great things come out of what we think of as being a hopeless situation. Yes, she had to go back. She had to make restitution to the state for the crime that she had done. No, it wasn't something super horrible. She had to do some some time, but in that process, she became an open book to where she allowed uh, the Lord to pour into her. She couldn't do anything else, right? There she is, you know. Uh, she, she gets on a little work crew to work a few hours a day and get her time done faster, but the most of the time, she's got nothing to do. And instead of just sitting in the room and watching uh, the, the one TV station they would let them watch, she's hungry to learn more about the things of God. I'm telling you, sometimes we've got to reach out and ask for help. Uh, she could have just kept running moving from place to place to place and had a life that but ever since she got out she's still in that little community in South Arkansas she still loves the Lord God has changed her life because she was willing to reach out to somebody and say I know you don't have the answers but I need some help church we've got to be willing to reach out sometimes we've got to sacrifice our pride and confess that we need help secondly don't give up until you get your answer I, this is where people can get hung up on this story. He ignored her. He spoke to other people about her. And then he called her a dog. Ah. Jesus, that's what I'm saying. Don't get hung up on these cultural things, right? Uh, 
why. The best thing I can do to describe this to you without doing a real in-depth Bible study here is just to say he was testing. He was testing this woman. He was going to show his disciples, everybody else that was present, and her just how great her faith really was. Sometimes the fire that God allows us to talk to, to, to walk through, is to show us about how deep our faith is and to show other people that are standing around about how great our faith is. And we go through those times. Remember, Jesus tested the rich young ruler. He, he failed the test. Oh, Lord, what do I need to do? Keep the commandments. These things I've done, what else do I need to do? Go and sell everything that you have, give it away, and then come back. And he left sorrowful because his things had him, you know, and he couldn't get rid of his stuff. Why did Jesus, he didn't tell everybody, go get rid of everything you have and then come serve me. Why this person? It was a test of that man's faith. The Lord knows the heart and we don't. And he gave him an opportunity to prove, Lord, my faith is in you, not in my material possessions. But he failed the test. Sometimes the things that we're going through are for us. And sometimes the things that we're going through are, are for someone else. And so we endure those things because other eyes are watching us. Other witnesses are seeing us. And they see how we walk through extended illness or the loss of a job or the the, the breakdown of a marriage or a wayward child. They see how we walk through those things. And they gain strength and faith in a God that's able to keep you not from the trouble but through the trouble. And so, but we just got to keep praying. You know, we've got to keep praying. Don't buy the story that well, you ask one time and then you leave it alone because if you ask more than once, it shows lack of faith. There are times when you will pray one time and you will know in your spirit that God's done it and you don't need to, to pray about it anymore. You will know. The spirit that is in you will bear witness and you'll know. And then instead of praying, you're just giving God thanks because you're saying, God, I know you've taken care of this. I know you've taken care of it. I don't see it yet but you've given me the witness that it's done. In all other instances, you keep on asking, seeking, and knocking until the Lord gives the answer. Yes, no, or wait a while, but you keep praying until you get that answer. Sometimes we've got to just keep pressing ahead and pushing through and asking, do you think that maybe Jesus is testing her humility? I think so. To say, well... I can't give the children's bread to the dogs. He was saying, we're Jews and you're a Gentile. What's sent for the Jews can't be given to the Gentiles. And so he's testing her to see if she'll... Can you imagine in today's culture, here, something like that is said, there's going to be marches and protests and, and you know, <laughs> oh, pastor calls woman dog, neighborhood in flames, you know, it's... <laughs> He's testing her humility. Sometimes we've got to be willing to be humbled. Well, in fact, all of the time we need to be willing to be humbled, to humble ourselves and say, Lord, by your grace, Lord, by your grace, I don't deserve a healing. I don't deserve a job. I don't deserve your blessing uh, because I'm the least of your children. But, Lord, here's my need. Here's my need in an humble spirit, trusting that some way or another God provides for his children, right? And so we got to, she just kept pressing ahead. She just kept, put. she wouldn't take offense. I remember very well when the Lord showed me, I've heard that all my life. I take offense at that. I take offense at that. Yeah, and, and, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. I take offense The Lord said, you need to tell people to quit taking it. Quit taking offense. Let it roll off. Don't pick it up. Don't take it. You say it yourself. Well, I take offense at that. Well, don't. Just don't. Don't allow that offense. Let it roll off. Just let it go. Don't don't take it and hold it and, and bring it to heart. If something's offensive, then just back up. Give it to God and let it roll off of you. But don't pick it up and let it get into your heart where it's going to put down roots and cause a problem. She didn't take offense at this. She just kept going. She said, I still don't have the answer. Jesus didn't answer me, and then he seemed to speak to other people about me, but he hasn't answered me, and now this that he said really isn't the answer. You know, he just says, well, I can't give the bread from the table 
for the children. I can't give it to the dogs. But he didn't really tell her, no, I'm not going to do this. So she kept pressing in until she got a straight answer from the Lord. So I love this. I would paraphrase it this way. Lord, if I'm a dog, then at least I know the correct table to be under because even a crumb that falls off the table is more than enough for me, you know. Uh, I'm telling you, we don't, uh, oh, just a little bit from God is better than a lot from any other source. We, we just, to get what God is willing to give. So, you know, we've got to keep our hopes up. We've got to keep our hope, we got to keep our hopes up. Uh, some of you have been praying for Eastgate a whole lot longer than I even knew that Eastgate existed, right? Some of you have been, uh, have, have been here through thick and thin. And some of you have seen high tide, and, and some of you are, you know, now are seeing a, a, the low tide. And, 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 you know, but folks, let me tell you, we keep waiting, and we keep asking, and we keep believing. And I'm telling you, church, that the prophecies and the words that have been spoken by evangelists and pastors and preachers and those of you where God has shown you things and revealed things to you and spoken things to you, they are not for nothing. They are not for nothing. And we, yeah, we're positioning ourselves in this winter season to get ready for what God brings at the next season. And it's going to be a time, you know what, I'm not even going to, tell you that it's going to be we're going straight from where we are to a time of exploding growth, but we're going to go into the season where we can begin to plant seed that we know is going to bring a harvest later on. And so right now we prepare and we're getting the seed, we're getting ready, and when the doors open to give the opportunity to sow that seed, don't get discouraged. Don't let your hopes get down. If the first time we have an outreach Nobody shows up or maybe nobody comes to church the next day or you don't get to pray with anybody. Don't, oh, well, it didn't work. Keep sowing that seed. Keep moving forward. Keep going because God is faithful and he will do it. He will perform his word in us. Uh, his promises are yea and amen. Keep your hopes up. You may have reasons for low expectations. People may have hurt you. You may be going through a season where it seems like your prayers aren't being answered. You may look at your life and say, ah, it just doesn't seem like God is doing anything in my life right now. But instead of basing your expectations on what you see, what you hear, what you touch, what you can think, base your expectations off this right here word, off your word, off what you know is true about God. Let the word of God be true. Let your thoughts and your sight and your knowledge and your understanding, let it all be graded lower than what the Word of God says. Because remember, there are things going on in the spiritual world that we don't have any access to. You know, and sometimes, some, sometimes I'd like to be like the, you know, the, the prophet's servant who God opened his eyes, and instead of seeing all the army that was there to kill him, he saw the army of God that was gathered on the hills around, you know, and it's just sometimes, but instead, we have to remind ourselves that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves that I've never been abandoned, I've never been left alone, and that the Lord promised he would never leave me. Sometimes we just have to remind ourselves that we serve a God who has promised to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We have to remind ourselves that Jesus said, I will build my church upon the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can't build it, but God will build it build it if we'll just be faithful and have high hopes and expectations and position ourselves to be tools used by the hand of the mighty God. So I don't know. Keep on pressing in. Keep on asking. Don't be afraid to ask God for the things that you need. Don't be afraid to lean on each other because our hope and our expectation, you know, even if we should be sick physically for the rest of our natural life, healing is coming. It won't last forever. Even if we should struggle financially for the rest of our earthly life, there's coming a day when we're going to live in beautiful splendor that we can't imagine. Even if our, we should get to the point where we don't have one human friend that would give us the time of day, we're going to spend eternity 
with a heavenly family that is just numbered as the hosts around the throne. All this is going to pass. All this, you know, is going to be over one of these days. It cannot go past the grave with us. It cannot go past the rapture with us. It will come to an end. So we give praise to the Lord and we trust in His timing. We keep seeking God and moving forward and trusting Him. So God wants to work wonders. I want to tell you, God wants to work wonders in your life. Didn't He say that these signs will follow those that believe? And one of the things He said was wonders, signs, wonders, miracles. Yeah, that didn't just mean Peter and James and John, but it means us today. doesn't just mean this guy that stands in front of the church but it means all believers. Sometimes to see those signs and wonders and miracles, we've got to ask, Lord, show up. I need you. I need you. Show up. Let me, let me close with one of my very favorite stories about how God can just show up. Uh, and I may have shared this before, so I'll be very brief. We had a missionary in our church who uh, had started a... Uh, a uh, Bible school in a uh, Central American country, and I can't right now remember exactly which nation it was. But God had had the finances to where they built a dormitory that would house a certain number of students, and they built their classrooms where they would do teaching, and they had uh, the the faculty lined up that was going to come and teach, and they had gotten all the governmental paperwork, everything God had opened all the doors. Everything was needed. The last thing that they did was that they dug the well for this property to be able to have water. And the well was dry. All the permits, everything was in place. They had a start date coming up very soon for when the first students were going to show up, and they had no water. They drilled the well, the, the company that they, the people that they had hired to drill the well finally said, we're not digging any deeper, either because they couldn't or just because they gave up as pointless and, and left them. And so there they are with this hole in the ground and no water. Now, God, you blessed us with the property. You blessed us with the finances. You blessed us with cutting through the governmental red tape. You've blessed us with all these things, but we can't have the Bible school that you put on our heart if we don't have water here. It's not going to be possible for us to tote water from wherever they would have to go to get it and and bring it. We've got to have water. And they worried and they prayed and they sent out uh, uh, messages to the churches that support them to pray. There was a, a church in the States that had sent down a crew of women who were coming down the weekend before they're supposed to start with kids on the campus. They had come down to uh, clean and decorate and make beautiful the place before the first student showed up. Well, they show up and there's still no water, right? So they go out and they pray around the hole. There's still no water. The women go and they start doing their, their chores and getting, getting things ready. He said the most elderly of the women came up to the missionary and said, come out there with me to the well. So they walked out to the well. <laughs> she said, can I pray one more time? Absolutely. He said, she said something like this. She stuck her finger up. Now, God, all this work has been done because you said so. All this has taken place because you told somebody to do it. But it's not going to be for anything. It's going to be for nothing If you don't put water in this well, this is your school, this is your plan, this is something you started, so God, you finish the work. Okay, let's go. Turned around and walked off. The next morning, there's water in the hole. Why? Because somebody was willing to keep asking and to keep praying and to keep standing on God's word. You didn't bring us this far. God works to bring glory to his name. Right? Isn't that what the Scripture says? God works all things together for for our good, but for His glory. So if God tells us to do something, you can depend on God not bringing embarrassment or shame upon His own name. Right? 
So what gives God more glory, a church that's growing and reaching people and making disciples and converts, or a church that has to sell the property and chain the doors and go away because they can't? It certainly brings a lot more glory to God when a church is doing the work of the ministry. So I'm confident that God is going to glorify himself at Eastgate Assembly of God. So we just need to be confident like that little elderly woman down there in Belize or whichever nation that was and say, God, this is your church. This is your issue. Now you do it, and here I am. Here I am. Use me however you want to, but you do it, God. Will you have big expectations with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Help us gain lessons from this uh, woman with the daughter who the Lord healed because she was persistent and pressing ahead and didn't get deterred from her purpose. And Lord, you answered her prayer. God, here at Eastgate, we bring our petitions to you and we don't understand why some sicknesses linger and why some things haven't been answered and why some struggles just continue to go. But God, we know that we are your children and we know, oh God, that you have promised to meet our every need according to your riches and glory. And Father God, we know that you have established and ordered Eastgate to be here and you've kept it through these decades of existence and we know you're going to do great things because it is your glory that is at stake. It is your name that is on the line, not mine, not these people. Lord, nobody nobody cares about us, Lord, as far as whether we get fame or glory, but it's your name and it's your glory, it's your church that is on uh, the record. And so God, we just want to be a part of it. Use us in whatever way is most beneficial to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen. May God give you courage and strength and open doors of opportunity for you to witness or pray or be a blessing to somebody this week. God bless you.